Okay. Um, can I welcome everybody to the seminar this, uh, this afternoon? Uh, my name is Catherine Meenan and I chair the Germany group in the Institute. Um, we're very pleased that this afternoon we have with us the German Federal Minister for Health, uh, Jens Spahn, who's a member of the, the Bundestag. He's going to talk to us for about 20 minutes, mainly on issues of EU health policy and the changes that have come about uh, since the beginning of the year and how he sees it going forward. Then we have a question and answer, and you'll be able to use to join the discussion using the question and answer function on Zoom, which you'll see there at the bottom of your screen. Send in your questions, please identify yourself when you're doing that. And I'll put them to the minister and we will try and use the time as effectively as possible. You can also join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. So now I'd like to formally introduce Minister Spahn and hand over to him. He was appointed German Federal Minister for Health in 2018. He's been a member of the Bundestag since, 20, to, since 2002, when he must have been the youngest member of the Bundestag. At, at the age of 22. Before becoming Minister for Health, uh, he had a variety of positions, including Parliamentary State Secretary of the German Ministry for Finance and Speaker for Health Politics in the CDU, CDU CSU Parliamentary Group. He's a Master's in Political Science. So Minister, over to you and thank you for being with us. Catherine, thank you very much indeed. And uh, thank you to all of you to make it possible to have this uh, digital exchange. And I only can uh, say thank you in general for the good cooperation we had and still have, of course, with uh, the Republic of Ireland uh, on a very uh, uh, personal base with Leo Varadka and Simon Harris, which uh, both I had uh, very close contact uh, regarding the Brexit issue and many, many other issues um, uh, of the past years. And of course, with Stephen Donnelly as well now in this crisis, Stephen has taken part in a digital conference of the EU uh, presidency of Germany yesterday. So actually, uh, it's a good way for me today to give uh, something back uh, uh, to uh, Ireland and to uh, uh, the uh, discussion we, uh, we have. Um, to the pandemic situation. When the first message of an airborne virus somewhere in China reached the Federal Ministry of Health and me personally, I would never have imagined the devastating effects COVID-19 would have uh, on all of us and actually of, uh, on all of our uh, all days uh, life. From direct effects on health to short and long-term economic and social impacts, COVID-19 has changed the way we live around the world. When discussing financial rescue packages or the reasoning behind wearing masks, we sometimes forget the unthinkable number of deaths and long-term illnesses due to COVID-19. Many have lost their lives and irrevocably more people will in the next months. Our thoughts go out to all who have lost loved ones. Apart from thinking about how to reduce the economic and social impacts of COVID-19, we have to first and foremost continue our work on keeping the numbers of infections and deaths as small, small as possible. Uh, COVID-19 is an ongoing pandemic, uh, and I know that uh, Ireland as well as Germany and all other European countries are just in the middle of fighting this real virus and bringing back control now in the second wave that has hit uh, Europe even harder, actually, uh, in, in, in many extents than the first one. So, ladies and gentlemen, as we're getting close to the end of Germany's presidency of the Council of the European Union, unfortunately, it's only six more weeks to go <laughs> till the end of the year and the presidency, let us take a look back on what we have achieved and which important steps need to be taken in order to reach our joint goal of a stronger European health capacity, or as uh, the Commission named it yesterday, a, a European Health Union. Um, so actually, as the uh, immediate response to the pandemic early this year, EU member states, including Germany, turned to the most functional level for rapid decision making. And uh, you just mentioned, Catherine, before this, I was in the finance ministry and we have developed as the European Union and within the Eurozone mechanisms uh, uh, to decide uh, and to be able to decide very quickly if necessary. So we have the uh, developed crisis mechanisms for financial crises. And uh, we had to experience in this health crisis actually that there was no real mechanism 
for European decision making in this, uh, frankly spoken, it even took, took very, very long till we uh, have uh, had pulled uh, ends together and finally met for the first time as health ministers. Uh, and uh, we are still uh, uh, still working on the right uh, 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 mechanisms actually for exchange, but on a very personal basis, and I just mentioned Stephen Donnelly and many others on a very personal base, bilateral, it works very well. Uh, and somehow uh, we, we get the decisions needed, but still compared to a financial crisis, there are still many things, especially mechanisms uh, uh, to be developed. So therefore, prompt coordination was not as possible in the area of health that we would have wished for. One thing was obvious uh, whatsoever, a virus doesn't know any borders, obviously, and so our co cooperation shouldn't either. As German Minister of Health, my priority is to mitigate the effects of the pandemic at national level, but finding a joint European and global answer to this transbordery crisis is more than just additional. It is a necessary complement. As we are still experiencing multiple waves of the number of infected people around the world, these priorities remain unchanged. Since the early days of a razor disorderly EU coordination, we have shown our strength when coordinating our efforts and engaging in mutual solidarity. Organized by the German presidency, we have held multiple informal video conferences on ministerial and deputy level, a type of event that I'm not a big fan of, frankly spoken, but which made it much easier to talk to my fellow colleagues regularly. I, by the way, I'm very convinced video conferences are much easier to do while you are meeting every now and then in person, because you need to know each other to really know what the other one wants. And with uh, many new health ministers just within the past six months uh, in different countries in the EU, uh, besides all these video conferences, it will be important to meet in person again sooner or later. So this intensified cooperation has simplified EU coordination on health a lot. The goal now has to be the implementation of stable structures, as I just mentioned, on European level, on which member states can rely uh, on in times of crisis. We will have to examine, examine the fla flaws in EU coordination made visible by the pandemic. This is why I support the Global Health Summit in Italy next year, as it has recently been proposed by Commission President Ursula von der Leyen in her State of the Union address. This summit needs to be a forum to rigidly discuss the lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic, bringing together the views from the EU, the G7, and the G20. In her speech, Ursula von der Leyen was also speaking of a stronger, and that was what they um, made more concrete yesterday, a stronger European health union, a notion that contains many interesting aspects that deserve further scrutiny. scrutiny. Uh, I can fully support this idea in regards to a robust EU crisis management in health, as well as closer EU cooperation in areas where a true European added value can be generated. We need a stronger European health capacity, firmly resting on the strong shoulders of EU member states. Uh, and let me just mention that one shortly. We really need to make clear where there is the additional uh, European added value uh, and where is the, the national capacity just for example the the uk okay, okay they are not uh, uh, in the eu anymore but the nhs of the uk and I, I, as far as I know, that counts for Ireland too. It's very much in the DNA of the country. It's traditionally, culturally, historically developed. Um, and so is the German system, the Bismarck system, so-called. It has a long tradition, uh, the French system. So you, we should not try uh, through coordination to have one big health system in Europe because that is a very national cultural thing. But at the same time, there are many areas where there can be added value for all EU citizens and all health systems through cooperation. And this pandemic has, has just shown one uh, uh, very important one. So ladies and gentlemen, in July, Germany took over the presidency. Needless to say that we had to reshape our presidency program in light of this unprecedented crisis. The presidency in this challenging times called for priorities in three fields immediate COVID-19 crisis response, strengthening of EU crisis management for the future, 
and the further development of the overall EU health coordination, including significant progress in various fields that we have worked on for many years. We summarize this ambitious set of priorities under our guiding principle, acting together towards European health sovereignty. With the emphasis on lessons learned, to, lessons to be learned from the COVID-19 pandemic, we have chosen four focus areas for our presidency. First, the aim to strengthen our preparedness for any future pandemic. COVID-19 has illustrated the need for a strong European Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the ECDC in Stockholm. We, the member states, together with the European Commission and European Parliament, have to support the ECDC in further developing its expertise in disease prevention to the benefit of all member states and EU citizens. By the way, you know that Germany has the Robert Koch Institute, uh, France has the uh, uh, Institut Pasteur, other, other countries at their institutions, but I know from colleagues from especially smaller member states that they don't just don't have these institutions, not this number of experts, even not at universities, and how much they are relying on the expertise of the ECDC and the advice that is given from the ECDC. So uh, uh, this is really uh, an European added value for many, many member states that there is a strong European authority with the ECDC and we want to make it even stronger and to achieve this goal and following the example of its US equivalent, by the way, the US CDC, the ECDC's mandate as well as its financial capacity and workforce have to be expanded. And by the way, I only I don't want it to be only expanded um, for EU uh, uh, issues or EU pandemic or epidemic or disease uh, uh, situations, but for uh, uh, activities abroad. Uh, uh, for example, in the Congo area regarding Ebola uh, as well. Uh, that is not yet in the Commission's proposal, by the way, but I was um, uh, down there in the Congo area uh, last year in September, and I saw a very strong US CDC being engaged there. And I saw Germany and France and others being engaged there, but there was no real European activity. So the strengthening of an ECDC to me means as well a strengthening of the work, and uh, not just within Europe, but as well uh, worldwide. Uh, in concrete terms, this involves the setting up of a so-called health task force intended to provide quicker crisis support to the member states. Furthermore, a standardized EU-wide digital early warning system has to be created so that on the basis of common criteria, potential health hazards can be evaluated in real time and appropriate predictions made. So in general, we want to strengthen the ECDC in this and in many, many other regards. The second focus of our presidency lies on ensuring supply of medicinal products in the EU. Shortages in particular uh, of APIs, active pharmaceutical ingredients of medicinal products in the off-patent sector, and the dependency on the third countries on, on, and on a few manufacturing sites for these products are issues of major concern for health systems. And by the way, issues that have already been there before Corona. Germany and other member states have already asked the Commission last year to develop a pharmaceutical strategy because we have suffered from shortages uh, from China and India already before this crisis, but this crisis has uh, uh, even made more clear uh, which big problem there is. So uh, actually, uh, we want to develop a, a more concrete set of measures together with uh, the Commission. And so I'm very grateful that yesterday uh, the Commission finally made first uh, a concrete proposals because this general idea of bringing back production of certain APIs to Europe needs to be underlined, of course, with concrete measures like the question of do we give uh, 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 incentives for uh, invest, uh, investments here in, in Europe and how uh, do we need to change procurement, uh, the procurement framework, how is the pricing done, how do we control, by the way, uh, uh, the good manufacturing practices uh, inside of the European Union and outside. So we want to strengthen the EMA um, uh, as uh, the uh, authority in that area, uh, and we want to change the concrete legal base 
in this area. And at the same time, we need to define the right degree of globalization. Uh, you can imagine that counts for Ireland as for Germany, countries that are so much depending on export, of course, should not uh, be in favor of a policy that actually wants to bring back all productions. <laughs> because if that is done by every country on the world, uh, we will lose our own wealth. Uh, and it won't be uh, very efficient. But there are certain areas where we need to bring back uh, at least additional production to Europe. And that is what the pharmaceutical strategy should, should aim for. And so the uh, third focus, ECDC, bringing back uh, uh, production in certain areas to become more independent. And the third focus uh, besides these two is a digital health uh, area and the work towards a European health data space. Improvements in the processing of health data with a view to digitalization. Big data and AI have been widely discussed in yesterday's high-level conference, Digital Health 2020, who on the move. One of the highlights of our presidency, and as I have just mentioned, Stephen Donnelly has taken part uh, uh, as well. The Commissioner, Kiria Kidestella, and I agreed that together with the member states, first steps towards a European health data space, as well as the development of targeted codes of conduct. In the area of health, the COVID-19 pandemic brought the need for more efficient processing of health data into sharp focus and demonstrated that secondary use of health data can strengthen infectious disease surveillance. For example, the exchange of data on intensive care beds to ensure swifter coordination of transboundary health services in a crisis. And in the middle of this continent, I can tell you that Germany has taken patients and is still taking from the Netherlands, Belgium, France, the Czech Republic, um, and some others. And we would, of course, ask our neighbors, vice versa, if needed. And for that, it makes sense to have a data exchange in that regard uh, uh, as well. So, uh, talking about the European health data space, what is important to me is it's about regulation. The conference yesterday made very clear uh, what is mostly needed for an added value for startups, for all stakeholders in the health sector, is that there is a legal fr framework, a legal base, regulatory framework uh, in regard to health data, very sensible and sensitive data is health, the most uh, sensitive you can think of, uh, personal data. Uh, and for that, we don't need 27 different approaches. In Germany, by the way, with 16 federal states, we have 16 different approaches. Uh, so we don't need 27 different approaches uh, uh, for a, a startup to scale. Uh, it needs one approach, one code of conduct, one legal framework, one legal base in the area of health. Uh, uh, that they can rely on. Um, and that is what we want to develop, interoperability standards. Uh, that is, I, I, yesterday I called it boring work because, you know, the new technology, uh, new apps, that's always sexy and you can show something. Uh, uh, regulatory work is always kind of boring and less sexy, but it's very, very important uh, to make Europe and the European Union more sovereign in regards to uh, digital uh, health, especially uh, compared to uh, kind of uh, capitalism surveillance uh, by corporations in the US and state surveillance by China. It's our own European uh, approach that we need to stand for and to develop to remain sovereign. The last issue I want to mention is uh, uh, the work within the WHO. Uh, we are would be happy, let me put it that way, if the new president-elect of the United States would stop the uh, process of the US leaving WHO, but nevertheless, uh, in some regards, the US and the current administration do have a point. The WHO needs reform. Its governance structures need a reform. The emergency structures need a reform. The funding needs a reform. It's not good that, I mean, there's always uh, 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 the complaint that most of the funding comes from private institutions. That's right. But the problem is that state institutions within WHO, the member states of WHO, just don't fund it enough. 
uh, an institution like the WHO can only be as good as member states let it be uh, 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 as good as member states give information to the WHO and especially give funding to the WHO and that is why within our presidency uh, for the European Union we have developed a common approach of all 27 together in the last council meeting end of October um, to have a common position on WHO reform and of course now we try to get in other players on the world to work on that with us. So actually these are many many important topics to develop a European added value for our EU citizens in uh, the area uh, of uh, health. Uh, one more to just uh, uh, name is EU for Health. I don't know if you realized uh, at the beginning of this week, uh, EU for Health was uh, get more money uh, in the trilogue of Parliament, Commission, uh, and the Council up to six billion uh, from uh, uh, just two billion. Uh, and so we want to make sure within the trilogue for you for health that till the end of this year, uh, we get it finished, the legal base, and that at the beginning of next year, all member states can use the money, now the higher amount of money actually through this compromise. Uh, so that will be the last legal uh, uh, package, I would say, that we can uh, and will uh, finish under the EU German presidency. But of course, Germany will remain very engaged in EU health policies uh, after the presidency in all areas that really give an added value. That's my most important topic. Added value on a European level, that should be done by Europe, and the rest should be done by the member states. Thank you very much indeed, and looking forward to the discussion.